I found uh, it's a sign. This sign hung outside of a uh, secondhand shop, and it said, the "Sign said we exchange anything, bicycles, washing machines, etc. Why not bring your wife along and get a wonderful bargain?" <laughs> I like this service. You know, I really like this service. Nine o'clock service has no sense of humor. We. We need some of y'all, you know, to come migrate to the 9 a.m. service. I need some people to laugh in that service. All right, this sign was in a health food shop, and it simply said, it was a health food store, and it simply said, we are closed due to illness. So that's a good one. Uh, yeah, I love this service. It's good. This one was on a, a farmer's field right there where the fence is. It said, the farmer allows walkers to cross the field for free, but the bull charges. So, good, good. Y'all are doing so good. So good. This message was on a leaflet. It said, uh, if you cannot read this leaflet, this leaflet will tell you how to get lessons. You'll get that in a minute. Uh, this... Uh, There were two preachers. There were two preachers on the side of the road, and they was holding this sign up on the side of the road. It said, this sign said, the end is near. Turn around now before it's too late. Well, driver passed by, and the driver put his head out the window, and, and he yelled at him. He said, leave us alone, you religious nuts. About three seconds later, you heard a big splash. <laughs> One preacher looked at the other and said, maybe we should have put on the sign bridge out. See, I thought, and y'all got it, I thought 9 o'clock service was like, you know. <laughs> y'all better not tell anybody. Huh? I know, trust me, I know. I know. <laughs> this sign was on a repair shop door. It said, we can repair anything. Please knock card on the door, the doorbell's broken. So, I love y'all. Do y'all know what today is? Do y'all know what today is? Making them up. <laughs> I wish I could make that up. If I could make up stuff and people laugh at it, that'd be awesome. I can't. Y'all tried to give me books, but those books ain't worth the... Man, they're not even good at all. Um, this is Memorial Day weekend, and we definitely do, don't want to downplay that. Uh, people that served our country. What's the saying? It says, all gave some, some gave all. Uh, especially those who have given their life for our country, for us to have the freedom to come here and worship the Lord and the li liberties that we have. It's an amazing thing. And so we definitely honor our veterans and those that have served. Yeah, y'all can clap. That'd be good right now. It's an incredible sacrifice. But today is also Pentecost Sunday, and uh, I just want us to look into Pentecost for just a little while today and just do it. And I put some notes in your bulletins. If you want to use those, feel free. If you don't, that's fine also. Make a paper airplane later, whatever you need to do. Help yourself out. But I put them in there if in case it helps you learn, then they're in there for you. But the reason I talked about some signs is because... The feast of the Lord, and Pentecost is one of those feasts. The feast of the Lord are also signs that point to Christ. The feast of Israel were also signs pointing to Christ. In Colossians 2, 16 and 17, it says, Don't let anybody condemn you for what you eat or drink, or for not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths. For these rules are only shadows of the reality Yet to come, and Christ Himself is that reality. The Feast of Israel, there were seven major feasts given by God. Seven major feasts given by God Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and Feast of Tabernacles. They were seven major feasts, and these feasts were given ordained, initiated by God. God told them when to do it, how to do it, who to do it, everything. And I believe it's in Leviticus chapter 23. You can go back in your spare time. I know you guys in your spare time, you love to read Leviticus, right? 
In your spare time, go and read Leviticus chapter 23. It talks about all of the feast of the Lord. And I want us to briefly, because if we're to understand Pentecost, I think we need to have a gist of all these other feasts. So real briefly, we're going to go through, and we're not going to spend hardly any time on each one, just so you can get a gist of what God was doing. When I say feast, I'm talking about a holy day or a big holiday. It was a special occasion for them, and they had those, these seven ones every year. And four of them had to do with the springtime harvest. Three of them had to do with the fall harvest. And they were very important times and seasons for them. And God had a bigger purpose. Did you know that God has a bigger purpose for a lot of things that we don't even know about? God has a bigger purpose for things. And that's what we're looking at today. So first off, Passover, the feast of Passover, speaks of Christ as the Lamb of God. Do you remember? You remember in children's church, surely you learned the story about the Passover where the last plague of Egypt, remember all the plagues of Egypt, the frogs and the lice, the darkness and the water turning to blood and all these things? Well, the last one was when the firstborn would all die. And God gave commandment to Moses to tell the people to take the blood of a lamb and put it on the doorpost. And when the death angel passed by, he passed over those people that had the blood on the door. That was the first Passover. That was the very first one, the Passover. And so the Passover pointed to Jesus Christ. It wasn't just something God did to do that one time. God was doing something to show us something. And when he's pointing to Jesus Christ as our Passover lamb, in 1 Corinthians 5 and 7, it says, Get rid of the old yeast by removing the, this wicked person from among you. Then you will be like a fresh batch of dough made without yeast. Yeast symbolizes sin in the word of God, which is what you really are, Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed for us. So Jesus Christ is the lamb of God at the Passover feast. The next feast is the unleavened bread. And the unleavened bread speaks of his sinless life. Remember I told you yeast was a symbol for sin. Well, unleavened bread was a symbol of purity and holiness. It had no yeast. Once you get a little bit of yeast in something, the process begins, and that dough would just swell and swell and swell. And that's a, that's a, a principle of what just a little bit of sin. When we open the door for sin in our lives, it's like yeast. And it just swells and gets bigger and bigger, and we're, we get more than we bargained for. Amen? Amen. So the unleavened bread feast was a symbol of his sinless life. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21. He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. All right? The next feast was the first fruits. And the first fruits speaks of his resurrection. Speaks of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 20, 23. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. And here's what's amazing about all these things. These were feasts of the Lord that he initiated back in Exodus and Leviticus. But there's something we need to know. Jesus was crucified at the Passover. Remember I told you it was the Passover lamb? He was crucified at the Passover. Guess what? He was buried during the feast of unleavened bread with his sinless body. See how God did that? Anybody want to guess what day he rose from the dead? It was the first fruits. When I told you God is in control and he has a bigger purpose from things, I wasn't kidding. God established these things hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago before Christ came and lived here. But He initiated so the world would see that this is the Son of God, the Messiah. The next piece is Pentecost. We're going to come back to it. But Pentecost speaks of His promise of the Spirit. Pentecost speaks of His promise of the Spirit. These four feasts prophetically, have already taken place. Prophetically. The Passover, Jesus was crucified, unleavened bread, he was dead and buried. The first fruits, Jesus rose from the grave. Pentecost, God poured out his Holy Spirit upon the church. Those things have happened. These next three feasts, which represent the fall season, 
for the Jewish people. These next three feasts are feasts that are to come prophetically. If you look at the prophetic calendar, the first one is the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets speak of the rapture of His church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. The Bible tells us that there is coming a day, and the Bible tells us it could be any day. It is imminent. It could happen any day. The Lord is going to call His bride home, and the church is going to be raptured. And this Feast of Trumpets, it looked to that day. The Day of Atonement speaks of the day that Israel will trust in Him. There are Jews today that trust in Jesus. They're called Messianic Jews, and they believe in Jesus Christ. But the nation of Israel as a whole rejected their Messiah. They did not see Jesus as the Messiah. And they rejected Him. The Bible tells us there is coming a day. The Bible calls it the Great Tribulation. The day of the Lord, the Bible calls it Jacob's trouble. It is a seven-year period of tribulation like this world has never, ever, ever seen before. And during that tribulation period, Israel as a nation will see Jesus as the Messiah. And in a day, they will turn to the Lord. Zechariah talks about this in Zechariah chapter 12 where he says, I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. It will become a reality that day. And they'll come to the reality that, that we have come to, I hope, that Jesus died because of our sins. And he was pierced and he was bruised and he was beaten and he was tortured and crucified because of me and my sinful life so that I might have life. So that's what the Day of Atonement speaks of. The Feast of Tabernacles, it speaks of his kingdom on earth. There is coming a day when God will get rid of all sin, the very presence of it. And we will live in perfect peace. The Bible says that a little kid could sit there and pet the mane of a lion. Or even play with an adder. It will not harm him. The word of the Lord says there will be no hurt in my holy mountain during that time. And there's a time that is coming. And the Feast of Tabernacles speaks of this. Revelations 21 and 3 talks about it. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself shall be with them and be their God. Now, this is not biblical. This part I'm going to tell you, but this is something that the Jews believe. Strict scholars of Jewish people believe that Jesus was born... During the Feast of Tabernacles. And that's important to us. Because when I read the Gospel of John chapter 1. It says that the Word became flesh. And one translation says. And He tabernacled among us. He dwelt with us. And so those are the Feasts of the Lord. The seven major feasts. Do you sort of get a picture? What God was doing. Is it not unbelievable that many, many years ago, God set these things up just so that we could see that Jesus is the Son of God? It's amazing to me. Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Pentecost was the right time, place, and people. Look at it, Acts 2, 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues as a fire, and it set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now look at this, the timing of God. The timing of God. Passover had just taken place. Jesus was crucified on the Passover, buried during the unleavened bread, rose from the dead through, by the, during the first fruits. And then 50 days later, or seven weeks later, the day of Pentecost arrived and God poured out His Holy Spirit. Because it happened on Pentecost, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of people that came from everywhere to Jerusalem. 
because it was one of the major feast days and they had to present themselves before the temple. So it was perfect timing for God. And he had set this up throughout the ages that would happen this way. It was the perfect time. The Bible says when Jesus rose from the dead, he spent 40 days with them. And then he ascended. And they waited there for uh, 10 days in the upper room for the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit. It was the right place. We don't know exactly where in Jerusalem. We know it was in Jerusalem. We know that it was in an upper room, someone's house, someone's building. It was a large upper room where they could fit over 100 people inside. And so maybe a place not quite as big as this place, but it was large enough to get 120 or so people in there. And it was at the right place because it was close enough. We know it was close enough to the temple that those in the temple that were, that were doing their Pentecostal things, their Pentecost rites, they heard the commotion when the Holy Spirit poured out Himself upon this group of people. They heard the commotion. They heard all these people speaking in other languages. And they all came running to the scene and said, What in the world is going on? So it was the perfect place by God. It was the perfect people also. Because I told you, people came from different places. People that spoke different languages. This is not in your notes, but in Acts chapter 2, it tells us that there were Parthians there, and Medes, and Elamites, and people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, the areas of Libya, Cyrene, and Rome. They had all come to that place at that time for God's specific purpose. And they had all these different languages. And when God poured out His Spirit at Pentecost, these believers started speaking in tongues of different languages. And the people all around them heard them speak in their own language. It was the perfect place. It was the perfect time. It was the perfect people. I say all this to say this. God has more going on in your life than you're aware of. His purpose is much bigger than, than your day, than your week, than your year. The people that, that have come into your life, it could be the enemy, it could be God. But God's using all of it to bring you to a place to know Him better. He's got a purpose much bigger than what we know. The first Pentecost was under Moses. And it confirmed God's old covenant. And I know today this is a little bit more like teaching and less like preaching. But I, I just feel as a Pentecostal church, we need to know these things. Pentecost is not just about speaking in tongues, alright? That is something that happened on Pentecost. But that wasn't the biggest thing that happened on Pentecost. And I, I, we've got to see this. The first Pentecost happened under Moses. The Jews believed that when Moses gave the law at Mount Sinai, that was the first Pentecost. They came out of Egypt, and seven weeks later, they would have been on the mountain or at the base of the mountain where God gave the law. Do you remember we spoke about this? The mountain was on fire, and there was earthquakes, and God set up a perimeter so no one can come up the mountain, and everybody was scared to death. Remember that? That was Mount Sinai, and that was God's power and presence, and nobody wanted God to speak to them. They said, speak to Moses. We're afraid. And so it was at Mount Sinai that God gave the law. This was the first Pentecost, and this is where God confirmed His old covenant. It was confirmed by the law. Stay with me just for a few minutes. The people of Israel, the God's people, were birthed out of Egypt, the Passover. That's the, they were really birthed at that point to become the people of God. But it was confirmed when the law was given, given at Mount Sinai on the first Pentecost. That's when it happened. It's interesting to note what happened though. Look at what happened when the law was given. Exodus thirty two twenty eight. The Levites obeyed Moses' command and about 3,000 people died that day. It's very interesting to note that the Bible tells us when the law was given, 3,000 people died. The Bible tells us that the law reveals the sinful heart of man. We didn't even know we had sin. It's that the law revealed it to us. You know what the law tells us? That our heart is impure. That our heart is unrighteous. That we need a Savior. 
And when the law was given, that death happened. Now let's go to the New Testament. The first Pentecost under Christ confirmed God's new covenant. How many knows we're under the new covenant? All right. I'm going elementary this. I just feel led to go elementary today. That's what we're trying to do. The first Pentecost under Moses confirmed the old covenant. The first Pentecost under Christ confirmed God's new covenant. We were birthed at Passover. The cross of Jesus Christ paid our way to be forgiven. He died on Passover. We were forgiven. Our sins paid for. But then Pentecost confirmed the believers, confirmed the early church when God poured out His Holy Spirit. Look at it this way. Moses went up the mountain on Mount Sinai during the first Pentecost. He spoke with God and he came back down with the law. The first Pentecost under Christ... Jesus Christ was dead, buried, went up to the Father, sat down at the right hand of God, and then poured out His Holy Spirit, the Spirit of grace, the Spirit of mercy, the Spirit of the righteousness of God upon the people. Now look what happened. Acts 2 and 41. Those who gladly received His word. This is the first Pentecost under Christ. Were baptized and that day... How many people were baptized? Did you catch it? When the law was given, 3,000 people died. When the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the believers, 3,000 people were saved that day. Do you hear what God is saying? Do you see why Pentecost is so important? The law shows us what we have to do. I want you to say that with me. Say, the law shows me what I have to do. The law said, have no other gods before me. Don't take the name of the Lord in vain. Keep the Sabbath day. Honor thy father and mother. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not covet. The law said these things that showed us what we have to do. The Holy Spirit was poured out. The baptism of the Spirit, it changes what we want to do I want you to say this with me say the Holy Spirit changes what I want to do do you hear the difference listen you don't have to say that part but I got you Hebrews chapter 10 I'm glad when you follow me that closely Hebrews chapter 10 verse 15 and 16 the Holy Spirit also testifies that this is so for he says this is the new covenant I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. What is God saying? He said on the first Pentecost, He gave the law. It was tablets of stone. It was something written. It was letters that said, this is what you have to do. But on the day of Pentecost that we celebrate today, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the believers and God instead gave them a new heart where the law was written written in a new mind where the law was written not just so they could remember it but it was actually a new heart that gave them new desires to follow after God's ways this is so important it's, this may not make you want to jump up and run down the aisles but man this is life changing transforming stuff if you can get this this is what we celebrate today the tongues are important the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I'm having a three-hour class today about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They're so, they're important. God wants to use them. He wants to use you and use them through you. But we must realize that Pentecost is the day that God empowered us, give us a new heart, and poured His Spirit into our life. Come on, praise team. Look, the Spirit gives us the power to live out our new desires. The Spirit gives us the power to live out our new desires. I believe God can transform someone's life. Perhaps He already has, as we were worshiping. One of my favorite scriptures, Romans 8, 2, and then we'll jump to verse 12 and 13. 
It says, because you belong to him, listen to this, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Verse 12, therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature, nature urges you to do. Did you hear that? You are not obligated. Can we be open? Can we be candid? Can we be honest? That we all have a sinful nature that has urges to do that which is against God. Paul said that. We have a sinful nature that doesn't want to follow God's way. But the power of the life-giving spirit that was poured out on Pentecost has set us free. That we're no longer obligated. In other words, there was a time when you were obligated to do. But you're no longer obligated to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. Help me. I'm going to try to help you. I'm going to try to help you. Verse 13. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body or your sinful nature, you will live. I want you to stand. I want to share with you this last scripture. I believe God wants to demonstrate His Word today with power. I feel like Paul today. It's not by my fine speech or articulation. Definitely not because of my outstanding jokes. But it's through the demonstration of power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to give you a moment and a minute to, to come and receive prayer. I believe God's got something for you today. He wants to fill you with His presence. Luke 24, 49 Jesus said, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. I like that word, endued. We're going to learn another Greek word today. Do y'all remember the Greek word we learned last Sunday? Somebody say it. Hooperbalo. Hooperbalo. That's pretty good. This Sunday... We're going to learn a new word. It is called enduyo. Enduyo. That's that word endued. And it means clothed with. Jesus said, tarry here in Jerusalem until you be clothed with power. So you got to love God. God doesn't leave us hanging. Here I am with my sinful nature. Before I knew God, don't really care. I'm going to do what feels good. See where it takes me. By the way, it takes you to a dark place. But now, now I've given my heart to Jesus. And Jesus has given me a new heart. I don't want to do that stuff anymore. I got new desires. But can I tell you something? Just having new desires, I doesn't, that doesn't fix it. Did you know just because you have a desire to do what's right doesn't mean you do what's right? I have a desire to eat better. I really do. And exercise more. But I don't always follow through with that. I got desire. But I just can't seem to sometimes get the willpower. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Huh? I'm not, I didn't mean it that way, but it's like, uh, with whatever, whatever. We have desire, but desire doesn't make it happen. Desire is the first part. You've got to have a new heart to desire. If you didn't have a new heart, you'd be no better off than those in the old covenant. They were told what to do, and they didn't do it. They failed God. But God's told us, He's written it in our hearts. We have a desire. If you're a believer, raise your hand. You know the Lord Jesus Christ? You got a heart that desires to do good and do right. You got a heart that's broken when you mess up. Amen. Do you hear me? It's broken when you fail. Because you got a new heart. But Jesus says, I want you to wait until you're in duyo, until you're clothed with power. In other words, he didn't leave me hanging. He gave me a new heart. But he knew that that new heart, 
I needed the power to live out the new heart. And so he clothed me with power. This is Pentecost. I don't always wear a jacket, but today I wear one to make a point. Clothed with power to live out the desire of my new heart. Do you hear me? You get it? You getting this? Look, guys, because you're going to say, Pastor, 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 Pastor. I hear you. I got desires to do right, but I'm still struggling. I'm still addicted. I'm still, sin is still dominating my life. I've been fighting the same sin for years and years, Pastor. What's wrong with me? As a believer, you have that new heart. Well, there's one thing about this. Jesus told them to, to wait in Jerusalem until they were clothed with power. God gives us the free will choice to walk in as little or as much power. He gives us the choice to be filled and overflowing with His Holy Spirit or to walk in dryness and defeat. And I just want to say this plain and simply. Some of you have chosen not to walk in the fullness of God. You got to put it on. You do. You got to put it on. What does God say about the armor of God? Does He say, put it on? Put it on. He says that about Christ. He says, put on Christ. He says it's about the Holy Spirit. He says, don't be drunk with wine where is an excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. If we choose not to be filled, we choose, we choose, we choose to not have the power that God desires for us to have in our life. And God has freely given this. Let's freely receive it. I want to ask today as they sing something just for a few minutes. I'm not going to take long. This is a question for you. And I want you all to answer it in your mind right now. Are you clothed with power? today 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 that's the key word today not did you receive Christ in 1990 not were you baptized in the Holy Spirit in 1978 not have you ever spoken in tongues or given out a prophecy or healed anybody no are you clothed with power today if you can't say yes to that question I want to pray with you today they're gonna to lead us in a song and I really believe God wants to do something special for you today. We're going to take just a few minutes. I'm not going to spend much time on you. Because I believe by faith, just by walking up here, you're putting on. And you're asking God to fill you with His presence. And God will do just that. Praise team, I invite you to come. God is dealing with you. Are you clothed with power today? Just stand across. I just want you to raise your hands and just begin to praise God, worship Him. This has got nothing to do with me, nothing to do with me. This is about the Lord. This is about His Holy Spirit. If you want everything God has for you, just raise your hands and say, God, I want everything you have for my life. I want the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank My you, Jesus. My soul longs and even faints for you. My heart and my flesh rise out for the living God, for the living God. Incline your ear. With trembling and tears of yearning To the throne of grace To seek your face I'm burning and longing for you I need you I need you Nothing, no place, no
satisfy the longing inside. Da 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 da. da. 